And now to our next talk. When we see the terms natural language processing or machine learning, often our guts are correct. And frequently it is vendor marketing material. And more often than not, it contains FUD. Our speaker, Joe Gray, served for seven years as a submarine navigation electronics technician. Currently, he is a senior OSINT specialist at Complex. Please welcome Joe Gray for his talk, A Decepticon and Autobot Walk Into a Bar, a new Python tool for enhanced OPSEC. Thank you very much for the introduction. <clears throat> and I would like to echo that you totally should donate to the EFF. They're a great organization. Uh, especially with the work they do with privacy. Uh, one of the first things I do whenever I get a new cell phone is I get there, come back with a warrant sticker and slap it on the back of the phone. So you should totally do it and totally get those stickers as well. Um, so this is uh, a Decepticon and Autobot walk into a bar. Uh, it is uh, my new uh, Python tool for enhanced OPSEC. The way I'm presenting this today is uh, different than one might expect. I'm coming at this from the perspective of you do OSINT or you're doing something and you need to maintain a SOC account and you don't really want to spend the time uh, or you don't have the time if you have the same problem I do, uh, taking the time to manage those accounts. This is a way initially starting only with Twitter to be able to do that uh, autonomously so that you can have a profile that is not absolutely bare. So about me, by day, I'm a senior OSINT specialist at Complex. Uh, honestly, I'm not a Python guru. Uh, this was a labor of love in many ways. I, I learned a lot from it. Uh, this is actually the byproduct of me working through tutorials uh, in different Python books and in some machine learning and natural language processing books. The demos that were provided in the book were good, but I'm one of those people that I need to build something to really get my head wrapped around it. Uh, that being said, I'm incredibly interested in data science, uh, specifically things like machine learning and natural language processing. Uh, I see what they can do for OSINT and social engineering, and I'm just trying to get my bearings with it. And that's what this utility uh, was built for. Uh, also about me, I'm a frequent competitor in the Trace Labs Missing Persons OSINT search parties. And in the most recent competition, my team, the Password Inspection Agency, got second place. Um, the next competition is one week from today, and we're hoping to get first. Uh, fingers crossed, but we'll see how that pans out. Um, and I'm very passionate about things related to OSINT and OPSEC. I see those two as the yin to the yang. So just to be honest, I'm not a programmer or a developer. I'm not a mathematician or a data scientist. And honestly, I'm not an expert when it comes to trafficking and domestic violence, which is an alternative use of this tool. Alternatively, it could be used for someone to abandon their account. So um, my degree is in IT with focus in security. The highest math I have taken has been basic statistics and college algebra. I'm currently taking some stuff on EDX, but I won't bore you with that. So before we get started, <clears throat> I want to provide a few definitions just so that we all kind of understand when I use the term what it means. So OSINT, that's uh, information gathered in an intelligence context from public sources. Oftentimes, uh, people, especially when we're talking about the people OSINT, the people spoon feed it to us and it's something that we really don't have to work too terribly hard for. In some cases, we have to draw conclusions and cross-reference data and what have you, but uh, in large, everything's from public sources. OPSEC, that's operation security. Basically, that's your ability to hide, masquerade, or confuse a potential adversary uh, based on what you are actually doing. So if you're on vacation in the Bahamas, post a picture to your Twitter uh, with some... Uh, with some EXIF data saying you're in Seattle or something to that effect. Uh, that certainly works. And I do know that Twitter and other social media platforms will remove that EXIF data, but that's just an example. Decepticon itself is a term I've been using for the last couple of years in doing presentations about OPSEC through disinformation and deception. Machine learning, <clears throat> it's some vendor buzzword bingo, but at the same time, the official definition is it's the study of math and the algorithms used to improve automation. 
Data science is the amalgam of several disciplines that use processes, programs, uh, and algorithms to gain insight from data. And when we're talking about insight, we're talking about things that aren't necessarily visible to the human eye. Artificial intelligence, that's some more buzzword bingo, but basically that's the study of any intelligence sought to be shown by machines through programming. And we're trying to mimic what is called natural intelligence, which basically is intelligence demonstrated by humans or animals. And a GPU, a graphics processing unit, basically it's a specialized system within a computer system that accelerates the processing of images or video, uh, but it is very commonly used in machine learning to speed up processing. Uh, they, it, for example, I'm running this on an NVIDIA Jetson Nano. Uh, the, the board itself has four gigs of DDR4, but the memory contained within the GPU is DDR6. So it's quite a bit faster. So in a general sense, the problem that I started with was one of the leading ways that adversaries find their ways into the lives of their victims is social media. So it, it's just like a hammer. Is a hammer a tool or a weapon? And really that depends on the intent of the person uh, in control of the hammer. So in this case, this was my initial plan for the tool. I was going to create it and we were going to use it for people to abandon their accounts. But as I started messing around with the code, I was like, you know, I could probably manage a few SOC accounts with this as well, which would be helpful in my um, OSINT and social engineering endeavors for the ability to gain access to groups to learn more or to be able to browse things without worrying about my regular accounts showing up in people they may know or suggested people for them to follow, depending on how those algorithms are written. So when we talk about adversaries in the lens of the initial thought and idea behind the tool, basically we were looking at malicious people seeking financial gain or to harm the victim. It could be abusers, traffickers, uh, take a drink if you're playing the buzzword drinking game uh, because of nation states. It could also be political opponents or for someone with very weak OPSEC, uh, someone who doesn't understand that just because Facebook asked you how you feel today or what you ate today does not mean that you need to publicly put a picture of your broccoli casserole on Facebook. So those uh, become victims of opportunity and the adversaries that just happen to stumble across that become adversaries of opportunities. So when we talk about victims, we've got public figures, victims of uh, domestic abuse or trafficking, and the final example from the previous slide, people with poor or misguided OPSEC. Uh, a friend of mine from the Navy and I were having a discussion not too long ago, and he was like, I don't have to worry about that. I use a VPN. I was like, mm, it can still be attributed to you. And he went to tell me which VPN he was using. And I was like, here's a link to an article about a data breach with said VPN. He's like, well, I also use uh, a specific DNS provider. And I don't remember what it was. It wasn't quad nine or anything like that. And I was like, that's still not how it works because that's just not the way the internet was designed. So people with good intentions can have misguided OPSEC. So some of the advice that I've heard, especially for like abuse victims, um, they say, just abandon the account. Well, that's not always feasible. It could cue the adversary in that hey, this person's not using this account now. Let me go check and see if there's another account that meets the criteria of the victim. Some people have to use social media for work. And honestly, I have to use social media for work, but at the same time, I've created accounts solely for the use at work. But not everybody segregates things. Uh, for me personally, I one of the maxims that I live by in terms of social media and my day job is, as long as I'm uh, a colleague of someone's, I will not send or accept a friend request to or from them. So some people, the first thing they do, hey, I finished onboarding yesterday, let me send friend requests to everybody. That's not, that's not smart to do to begin with, but from an OPSEC perspective, it's definitely not smart to do. And honestly, why should someone live in fear? Why should your SOC account have to live in fear of getting shut down because you don't have the time to manage it. 
I created a Twitter not too long ago for something I'm trying to get off the ground called OSINT News Monthly. I followed 16 other Twitter accounts. I never tweeted. I never sent a DM, nothing. And the account got suspended, presumably because it had the word news in it, honestly. But why, if that were a SOC account, why should I have to worry about it getting shut down? Because sometimes the sources that people use, journalists, pen testers, OSINT professionals, threat intelligence professionals, they have to manage and, for lack of a better term, babysit those accounts to manage them and make sure that they stay safe. And then, honestly, some victims, they're not aware that there is an adversary until it's too late. Dissecting this a little bit more, well, why don't, why don't we just block the person? Well, they can continue to cause trauma because they can create fake accounts. They can create an alternative account under their real name and leverage things like friends of friends. If the victim is using an alternative account, then the abuser could go through and report those accounts for being fake and get them taken down. That being said, I don't know how aggressive Facebook would be with that because I've reported several accounts that appear to be involved with child trafficking and they are still there. Um, they, people can still reset passwords, especially if it was like a long-term relationship or a relationship that was very intimate. The abuser could potentially know all of the password reset questions, which that, that amplifies uh, some of the wisdom that we're hearing in the OPSEC world now about totally lie about your password reset questions. Don't use your mother's maiden name because honestly, I can just hop on Family Tree now or True People Search and get that. And from a corporate perspective, companies can still be exploited. So as an OSINT investigator, I'm always skeptical of subjects that don't have a presence, more so than those who have some presence. And Subject, I, I prefer to use the term subject when talking about people and targets when talking about companies. That's just uh, Trace Labs calls it subjects, and I, I do quite a bit of stuff with uh, that team in terms of training and competing and contributing to their guides. But at the same time, I thought about it, and I feel a little bit less slimy uh, going through and searching through social media uh, using the term subject as opposed to target. But at the end of the day, why should we not have autonomy and agency over what's posted with minimal effort? And honestly, that goes for uh, a victim as well as a SOC account. Because if we want to maintain a SOC, for example, we want to create uh, a SOC account that has a specific political leaning. Well, we can go find some of the influential people that people of that political persuasion follow and insert their handles within this version of the Decepticon code. And at an interval, this code will go out, read their tweets, run it through the model, and post. That is pretty good autonomy with minimal effort. So here are links to the repos. Uh, the two different I've got two different forks of the code there. So if you do the clone from GitHub, Basically, what will happen is you'll get the entire Decepticon bot. Uh, the bot itself in the tensor directory is the one that will read from your account and tweet in your likeness. The one in the uh, SOC edition will tweet from the likeness of others. Um, I do realize that I need to go in and remove the line where it appends hashtag Decepticon and mentions hope, uh, the conference. Uh, so I'll be making that change to GitHub as soon as this presentation's over, but uh, <clears throat> you can very easily run with that. So about the code itself, it's written in Python. Uh, I've got several versions that I'm working on. The version that's published is written with TensorFlow, and I hope it's pronounced Keras. Uh, could also be Keras. Not entirely sure on that, but it's spelled K-E-R-A-S. So we know that part's correct. Um, I'm using the specific NVIDIA port of TensorFlow version 2.20. Uh, the other one uses PyTorch. I'm not discussing it in this presentation. I'll explain why a little bit later. In terms of organizing the data, I use Python's uh, Pandas package to use data frames. I don't use uh, Jupyter Notebook, but if you do, uh, Pandas will show it to you kind of like a spreadsheet. So it's just kind of easy in that regard uh, for me. 
Uh, there are other ways to do it. Within it, I'm using a long short-term memory model to generate the text and the, the Keras package is the vehicle for that long short-term memory model. So what is a long short-term memory model? In short, it's a type of recurrent neural network. So a, a recurrent neural network basically takes into account past decisions uh, to influence the outcome of the new decisions. So if you are following certain accounts, it's, it's like uh, the time a few years ago that someone was just reading tweets and sentiments from all over the place and people found out about it and started posting in those places and basically the the bot that was doing all of that ended up becoming racist because of all the people posting racist stuff to just as a prank so uh, a recurrent neural network is subjected to that uh, but basically they have the capi uh, the capa uh, capability to remember previous things learned and that's saved in a model file so what's beautiful about this is the vector size uh, is not a fixed size, which makes text, speech, and images uh, processing through LSTMs and RN, RNNs very ideal. Because for this particular version of Decepticon, I have plans to uh, write it for both Facebook and LinkedIn at later times. I just have to find the time to do so. And the thing about it is the Twitter version okay, the vector could be up to 200 tweets, up to 280 characters. But whenever you start including things like mentions, hashtags, links, and the code actually scrubs that out, then it certainly changes the game quite a bit because nothing's going to be of a direct fixed length. That, and if anyone's actually analyzing the account, they are going to make note of the, every tweet is precisely 273 characters. So uh, with that, an LSTM is going to learn those order uh, dependencies and sequence prediction. And admittedly, uh, tweets are a very small data set. The API has a limit of 200 tweets to be able to, that you can pull down if you have rate limiting uh, sleeping turned on, which the code does. But even 200 tweets is a very small data set for this. So the accuracy is not there yet. Um, and as I said before, LSTMs are very popular for uh, natural language processing because of the sequence prediction and dependency analysis. For another piece of code that I'm also working on, uh, that's a fork of this called Intercepticon that would attempt to identify bot behavior, it would look for the dependencies and errors within the grammar associated with uh, poor translation. So basically the equivalent of not being a native speaker and relying on Google Translate. So how does the code work? We start with a set of Twitter API keys and the uh, Python Twitter package. That's going to allow us to authenticate to Twitter and pull down the tweets for the user. Uh, by default, the tool is only going to read those of the owner, but it has been modified to read anyone's tweets as long as the person or account tied to the API can read them. So you can't go reading protected tweets. Um, I haven't tested it for reading protected tweets for people uh, for whom I can actually read their tweets. Uh, that would be a, an interesting case study as well. But nevertheless, uh, it, it's a potential limitation. If you don't have the sleep on rate limit enabled, you will pull down about 30 tweets at a time. Uh, if you have it enabled, you can pull down 200. If you have access to a larger API like uh, an enterprise API or the Firehose API, then the 200, uh, as far as I understand, goes out the window. From there, we capture the text. We parse everything out. We parse the text of the tweet into one column of the data frame. We capture the time and convert it to epoch time and save it to another column. And then we measure the lexical diversity. That's basically the ratio of the words used to the length of the text. So it's not very important in this particular iteration. It will be more important in future iterations uh, as it will measure things and ensure that the text is within tolerance or to make sure it's within tolerance, but at the same time, not too perfect. 
Uh, from there, we tokenize the tweets, which basically just means we separate it into words uh, so that we can create our corpus. And a corpus in the world of natural language processing is just a large body of text used to produce something. So I called it the bag of words. Uh, the variable within the code is BOW. So we collect some more stats, some things, uh, standard stats, frequency analysis in terms of the most commonly uh, used hashtag, the most commonly used links, uh, the most common accounts mentioned, and then uh, also post interval. Post interval is very important and I'll explain why in just a second. So then we move into the generate module where we establish our vector sizes and sequences. We measure the number of patterns. To accomplish this, we actually convert all uh, characters to numbers. And that's how the model actually works to um, works to establish the sequences and do the predictions. So it runs through pre-modeling. That's going to do the model. Uh, it's going to create the model file. It will set x, y values. Um, and then from there, we're going to move into the trainer module, which creates a pseudo random seed uh, based off of the information contained uh, in the corpus and um, stuff from that nature. Tweet creator actually executes the model, assesses the predictions. Uh, I've limited it to 40 words. So anything more than that tends to go over 280 characters. Uh, incorporating spaces and all of that stuff as well. We have a logic check next, and that's where we do that to verify the two, the 40 uh, words. We remove any links, any known characters to occur. Um, if you have been following along on my C underscore three P Joe account or the DC eight six five underscore owl account where I've moved the tweets to, you probably saw a few tweets that's nothing but. Um, apostrophes and commas, and then there were a few that included brackets. I've written logic in there now to remove them. And then after that, it tweets. So the reason that uh, for the posting interval, um, it's not mentioned on this slide, but posting interval basically is a measurement, uh, a statistic measurement of the epoch times. And that is what determines how long the code will wait before it acts again. So I've got a demonstration on the next, uh, the next slides for the demonstration, but we'll take a look at the code first. So uh, we won't go through it too fast, but uh, a big thanks to all the people who helped me out with either figuring out some of the Python stuff or some of the logic stuff, giving me insight as to how things worked, as well as uh, the people we're about to see defined as users. So this part, let me go to the bottom first uh, before we start defining. Uh, modules. So with this, we get the stop words. That's not used in this particular iteration, but it could later. Uh, the directory, we just determine what directory we're in. We check for the existence of files. That's where we're going to save the model files. And that's also where we're going to save the CSV. That is the output of the data frame. So basically, at one point, we are going to write the data frame to uh, a CSV and save it there. Um, from there, we check for the presence of a GPU. If there is a GPU, then we uh, set the memory growth there. Um, and then from here, we've defined the API. I've got a separate file where we put the API keys in. Uh, that's handled in the imports. We define the module as, the model as sequential. That's for the LSTM. Uh, we'll do that a little bit later. And then the results would be get the user timeline. It's just get timeline if it's an actual, if it's the your account. So then going back to the top, first we log in. Uh, I set the global variable for the data frame. Uh, we move into the directory. So that's just to make sure that uh, we uh, aren't in the files directory. And then I set users as a global variable. In this case, uh, I don't have the accounts listed here on the GitHub, but the accounts that I referenced with consent of the um, account owners were Dreadjack, Sawaba, myself, Nostia, Cheerio, and Wondersmith Ray. So then we check to see if the CSV exists. 
If it doesn't, then we define the data frame and move into tokenization. If it does not, or I'm sorry, if it does, then we read it. And then we move into tokenization, which is here. Uh, BOH, BOM, BOL, bag of hashtags, bag of mentions, bag of links. So I'm really not creative when it comes to variable names. So we just get the user timeline and this is for you in users. So uh, you have to have something defined above for this to work. Uh, it pulls down the tweet, uh, does a few regular expressions to pull out hashtags and mentions, adds them to the baggers, uh, which will uh, append them to the lists above. Then from there, we move into the hopper. We do the same thing again, but at this time, we measure epoch time and lexical diversity, uh, substituting out mentions and hashtags, and we append everything to the data frame there. Uh, once that for loop is done, we drop duplicates, uh, because if we don't, that file size is going to get unmanageable very quickly. Then we move into the sorter. Uh, the sorter basically is just going to uh, convert all of the rows uh, containing tweets into a list. We tokenize them. From there, we append it to the bag of words. We write the data frame to the CSV. We do our stats on it, which here, we, as you can see, um, we're doing lexical diversity. We get the mean of uh, the lexical diversity. We get the standard deviation of lexical diversity and times. We determine post interval. And then from there, um, we do a little pop up on the screen about that. Uh, we do the frequency analysis. So it's just showing the hashtags, links, and mentions. And then from there, we move to generate. Here, we define characters. This is where we convert characters to numbers. Uh, we determine the input length, the length of the characters. Uh, that spits out on the screen. Uh, from here, this is just defining a few things before we get started. We move into pre-modeling. So within pre-modeling, this is creating the model files as a JSON file and an H5 uh, FS file. Uh, we compile using cross, uh, categorical cross entropy and RMS prop for the optimization. Um, and then from there, it goes through. It, we do it with the GPU if it exists. Uh, then from there, we run it for seven epochs in a small batch size. I've tinkered with the sizes for the size of the LSTM and the batch size uh, to be able to try to prevent memory from getting out of memory vulner or uh, I'm sorry, out of memory errors, but it definitely exists. Uh, then from here, if not, we move into modeling. Here we define an LSTM of 160 bits, looking for a 60% dropout, uh, looking to return the sequences. Uh, so we just add that a few times, uh, activation softmax. Um, compile it as we saw above. There's the file path for it. Uh, the checkpoints are going to show uh, the file path, the loss with verbosity, saving only the best. And then uh, here's where we actually kick it off again, X and Y, as we saw above uh, with seven epochs, same thing there. Uh, we will load the weights from the file name. That's going to be uh, the H5 uh, FS file. Everything else here is the same. Goes into the trainer. From here, <clears throat> we're going to have the random seed. Um, so just using uh, NumPy's random and a random interval here. Then the tweet creator. So we move all the characters there uh, from the bag of words, convert them uh, back to characters from numbers. Uh, we create the process. So it's just going to run through. This is based on uh, data from the uh, LSTM, we go into cleanup. This is removing links, erroneous characters, as you can see here, mentions, hashtags. Uh, these are all the things that I observed. Uh, and then right here, post update is where it's actually going to post. Uh, and then the repeater right here, post, post interval. And then I set a random interval between zero and 480 seconds to subtract from post interval, just so it's not perfect every time even though every time you tweet, the post interval is going to change to a degree. Uh, and then for subsequent, it just preloads everything else and then moves into tokenization. So that's the code. Here is the actual um, 
demonstration of the code. So I'm gonna speed this up a little bit from time to time. So the code's just kicking off. So it's connected to Twitter, receiving, re retrieving the tweets. Uh, there we see um, tokenization, uh, lexical diversity. There's our post interval. Here's the frequency analysis. So the accounts this one's looking at, uh, it's been using hashtags for DEF CON memories, EFF30, OSINT, OSINT search party, OSINT the planet, Decepticon, so forth and so on. It's been mentioning Kyle Bupp, Nostia, NSOC, Cory Doctorow, and so on. Then we see the number of characters and vocabulary. So this is just everything running through in the pre-modeling. This version, uh, to be able to get a solid recording, I turned the epochs down from seven to three. So you can use ever how many you want. Uh, the quicker you want it to pump out, the fewer epochs you probably want to use given the data set size. <clears throat> I did edit the time in between. Um, each epoch takes uh, between 350 and 450 seconds right now. So right here we see where it, like, it jumps really quickly. So within the demonstration itself, we have about another minute or so. So as we can see here, ETA six minutes, and then it goes down to 10 seconds. That's just an edit for, in the interest of time. So as this finishes, we have the random seed created, creating the tweet. <clears throat> and there is the tweet. So, Somebody needed to do GP update before they went to bed. I have a pretty good feeling as to which account said that. But anyway, um, nevertheless, um, this is just reading from those accounts. Is it perfect? No. Is it accurate enough? Quite possibly. Uh, so then from here, everything I'm showing you is off of JTOP. So this is before the epoch starts. We see a high memory utilization. In some cases, it ate up a lot of memory. So as you can see here, I've got 50 gigs of swap. Um, and I'll show you once we go talking about the platform, uh, how I accomplished that as well. Um, but as we see here, everything's growing. The GPU is starting to rev up. And there goes the GPU. So at this point, I can tell you it is in an epoch. So for six minutes, everything's just going to, it's just going to tax that GPU very hard for about six minutes. Uh, we're not gonna watch it for six minutes, uh, but then from there, just looking at other stuff within this, um, oh, that was showing that it was going through an epoch. This is just looking, um, so next we're going to look, that's at the GPU stat, uh, usage. That's at the CPUs, all four of them. So it's got a quad core arm. And apparently my video froze right here as I was exporting it. Uh, there's really not much else to see. It's just uh, showing data about the fan and what have you. So we're not missing the meat and potatoes of this. So basically the project started around December of last year. I ran into a lot of shiny objects, a lot of squirrels, a lot of distractions and delays. And I'd written a few things before, like WikiLeaker and the Recon NG module. And I'd been reading about the stuff, as I said before, and that's what kind of triggered it. Uh, the project stalled pretty good around March, but I, <clears throat> I joined Brian Brake's uh, CSEC East group for a, uh, to give a talk. And one of the other presenters was talking about the Jetson platform. And I looked into it. I was like, hey, this is cool. So I ported the code over because before I was doing it on uh, a VM with three cores, eight gigs of RAM, just a standard Radeon GPU on a MacBook Pro. And to be able to get through one epoch took about an hour. This is what the Jetson Nano platform looks like. Uh, the, one, the pictures on the right are the bare bones platform. 
On the left, that is with a T300 card attached to it using a USB bridge. On the bottom, you'll see that there's uh, a solid state drive connected to it as well. So I've got the main operating system of the Jetson running on a 256 gig micro SD card on the main board with uh, right now, I think I have my one terabyte solid state drive uh, in the bottom. So that works out for uh, utilizing swap or anything else as necessary. Um, but yeah, it definitely, uh, it's definitely efficient. Uh, basically the specs on it is it has the quad core ARM processor with Tegra support and the GPU has 128 CUDA cores. This is the uh, same case that I use. I don't have the Wi-Fi antennas or the camera attached to it. All in all, I have about $250 wrapped up in mine, but the Jetson platform itself is only about 100. Why I went with that, very simply, it was external to the regular host. It had the GPUs with the CUDA cores, so it was able to expedite that analysis. And then someone had mentioned it to me, so I decided to test it. So lessons learned, <clears throat> data science is not a walk in the park, especially if you lack that heavy math background. PyTorch is faster than TensorFlow, but uh, as I have attempted thus far, it is less reliable in output. I'm sure it is an operator error issue, but it's definitely something uh, that I wasn't able to get working yet. That being said, um, you may, if you attempt to play with this, you might have far better luck with PyTorch. Uh, I do plan to eventually port it over to PyTorch and have subsequent versions, but um, just not there yet. So keep in mind that if you test this on your regular account, be prepared for a few things. Be prepared to lose followers. Be prepared for people to point out, hey, this is annoying or obnoxious, borderline spammy. And I mean, I I hold no ill will against that because they were absolutely correct in the statements, the people who sent me those uh, DMs. And I actually appreciate them coming to me as opposed to just blocking me, following or unfollowing me or reporting me. So keep that part in mind. If you don't tweet frequently, like very frequently, you're going to have to edit the code to put in the stuff for, um, to edit the posting interval, which is what I've done for this. Um, that and most of my tweets have been, hey, I'm offering an OSINT course on such and such date. So my bot started offering courses from the past as well as uh, coming up with patterns and offering courses in the future with non-existent dates. So uh, I also ran out of uh, like, to give it a data set to work off of. I tweeted in 280 character chunks, uh, some poems like Jabberwocky, The Raven, Still I Rise, We Wear the Mask. Uh, but then I also, out of jest, did Smash Mouth's All-Star and a Rickroll. Um, when you're dealing with this kind of stuff, prepare to do a lot of hypothesizing and a lot of A-B testing. And as I stated before, 200 tweets at around 280 characters each is a very small data set for an LSTM. As of right now, uh, the code's written to make use of GPUs and CUDA cores. If you do it on a server or a VM, it can be very time consuming and leasing GPU processing uh, in the cloud is also very expensive. Uh, and again, the model is dependent upon what your account has posted or the accounts that you're pointing it at has posted. If you, if you or the subjects of those accounts wipe those accounts uh, or it's a fresh account like for a SOC, <clears throat> you're going to need to get something posted for it to work. So you could write some of your own stuff or just immediately jump in and edit the uh, user's line. I think it's line 29 uh, to have it take a look at a few accounts. I don't recommend doing more than about uh, three to six accounts uh, just because of the size of the file. It can get uh, tricky really quick. That being said, uh, I'm going to open it up for questions. And we're back with Joe Gray. That was a really fascinating talk. So, just make sure you can hear me, okay. Yes, I can hear you. Just, <laughs> all right. So, um, do you have some questions from the Matrix chat? Again, the only way you can ask questions of any of our presenters at HOPE 2020 is by being an attendee in the live stream chat channel on our Matrix instance. So uh, first question, you mentioned the Tech Lab OSINT events. Uh, 
our questioner has a general mistrust of, pol of police, but these, these OSINT events do sound fun. Do you know more about how they partner with law enforcement? Um, I am not a staffer uh, with Trace Labs, so I can't uh, provide an official answer. My understanding is uh, it's very similar to like a call for papers, uh, kind of like a call for subjects. I will say that in those events, the uh, bulletin provided to work off of typically comes from NamUs or the uh, country's equivalent of something like NamUs or the Center for Missing and Exploited Children, something to that effect. Um, and then basically law enforcement themselves may compete, but uh, Trace Labs acts as a conduit in between the two because as all the information is submitted, uh, the judges and staff take uh, some time to clean up the data, deduplicate the data, uh, assemble it. That's when you see their stats posted about the numbers of pieces of intelligence, and then it's handed off to law enforcement. To my knowledge, there's no way that law enforcement has provided a name to be able to come back to. Um, and I'm sure if something like that were to happen, it would be law enforcement would go to Trace Labs and Trace Labs would ask for consent of the user, but I don't know of any situations that that's been the case. But again, I'm not a Trace Lab staffer, so I can't speak officially on the topic. Okay. Um, now, have you considered adding functionality to your bots that could add the generation of seemingly convincing images based on previously posted media the user has already posted? Uh, I've considered that. Um, something I do want to play with uh, for both uh, OSINT and OPSEC uh, is imagery. I've been looking at some stuff uh, put out by, I think it's the University of Chicago, I don't recall, um, that uh, it's called Fox. Um, it is, I've got it pulled up. Uh, it is at the University of Chicago. It's called Fox, as in Guy Fox. Uh, it's image cloaking. Uh, so I've been looking at that from the OPSEC perspective, but um, doing like AI created uh, images, um, it certainly uh, it certainly is within the realm of possibility. In the future iterations, uh, my next three iterations that I've kind of already started drawing the diagrams for include the capability of responding to DMs, replying to mentions and retweeting as well. Yeah, uh, I see it. I see a question of what was the daughter card on the Jetsa SATA interface. Mm -hmm. um, I was just going to get to that, yes. <laughs> oh, my apologies. <laughs> no um, worries. The other card is called a T300. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, if you look, I've actually, if you click that uh, Amazon idealist right there, it has everything that you need for the entire getup, including the Jetson, the T300 card, uh, the uh, solid state drive, micro SD card, everything you need, except, mm -hmm. and, and actually I may have even put the Wi-Fi antennas on it, even though I don't have them. Well, I mean, this talk convinced me to finally, to finally mensch up and get a Jetson of my own to work with for some projects. So I'm really impressed by that. If anyone um, from NVIDIA is listening, uh, shoot me an email to send royalties. <laughs> now, um, you were talking also about the lack of a math background for data science and machine learning. Do you have any recommendations for someone to get up to speed on, on data science or machine learning resources for individuals that are just starting out in these fields? Absolutely. I'm, uh, I'm turning around to look at my bookcase um, that can't be seen even if I had the camera on because of a green screen. Um, that being said, uh, no Starch has uh, a natural language processing book uh, right now. Mining social media is good as well. Um, uh, neural network projects with Python is uh, another good one. Uh, it doesn't really teach you how to do things, but Weapons of Math Destruction is a good book for that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, um, shameless, sorry. <laughs> Oh, go ahead. I was about to say, yeah, quick shameless uh, shout out to our friends at No Starch Press. They do have a discount just for conference attendees. Look up the wiki for more information on that. <laughs> on the other topic of shameless plugs, um, order my book uh, due out via No Starch Press on October 13th. Uh, it is not available on the uh, 
no search website yet. Uh, I have a short link, uh, preorder.seosint.xyz. It's nothing but a redirect uh, link. It'll take you to the Amazon page. If you're not comfortable with that, just search for practical social engineering on Amazon. One third of the book is OSINT. That is awesome. Um, now, did you speak back to the question about uh, the tools, that, tooling that you used? Did you consider pandas or other higher level data science tools rather than trying to work directly with PyTorch or TensorFlow? Uh, I didn't because I, being a relative noob with Python, uh, pandas was what I was comfortable with. One of the books that I had been working through was a hardcore advocate of using pandas. So I just stuck with what I knew for now. Uh, that being said, if this blows up into something that requires a lot more love, I would be more open to using something else as well. Uh, the pre-order link, I will put it in the chat. It is HTTP, but that's because it's a redirect domain. Okay. And um, so again, we're trying to pull up that, path, that last page there so we can show the GitHub repo. And, okay. okay. Uh, the GitHub repo, right? Yeah. Yeah, that one right there. Uh, go for it. And then I've actually got a coupon code uh, for something uh, that takes part, uh, takes place in one hour and 15 minutes if anyone is interested. Uh, depending on where you, uh, depending on where you are in the world, uh, I'm giving six hours of OSINT training starting at uh, 10 p.m. Eastern time. I failed okay. to update my slide. So it's 10 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, it's going to be six hours of people OSINT. It is directly aligned to the missing person CTF. If you want to do it, uh, use coupon code HOPE1337 for 25% off. All right. So um, one last question here. Um, in your experiments, how many followers did you find that you lost or possibly even gained? Uh, I gained quite a few. Um, lost, I know, uh, I would say... It could be as many as like 200. Uh, I don't know. Um, the one thing I didn't think about doing in the very beginning was to pull down every single follower and do like a diff of it. Uh, if anyone else attempts that, I would be interested to know their statistics. Um, so given the number of followers I have, I like unless I'm on the mobile app, I can't see an exact number. I only see like uh, 11.2 or 11.3 if I'm on the web, like on a browser. So that made it a lot harder because I was spending a lot less time accessing it via the mobile app. So uh, had I pulled every follower down at the beginning, I could have done some pretty good X, Y uh, or AB testing in terms of who I lost and who I gained. I, yeah. Oh, actually, uh, we've got like two more minutes. Uh, I didn't even show you this, uh, but here's actually the uh, account that I've been posting to, this is what it's been uh, tweeting as of late. So hey, that's uh, pretty cool. right here's a Rick roll and uh, there's some stuff about <laughs> living under a rock. Uh, there's another Rick roll. Yeah, some um, of the folks in the chat noted that this seems uh, kind of like epic drunk posting. <laughs> uh, that's kind of what it is uh, because like I said, I didn't have, uh, my, my post interval uh, starting out was about 12 days. So I was like, I can edit the post interval or I can post a bunch of stuff. Uh, so tweeting, All-Star, Raven, uh, the Rickroll, all that in 280 character chunks. Doing that, I mean, it, it drove the interval down, but it didn't drive it down far enough. So I ended up having to modify the code anyway. So yeah. Um, it's definitely interesting. Okay. Well, Joe Gray, thank you for joining us at Hope 2020. Can't wait to see you when we can next uh, meet up again in person. Sounds like a plan. And do know that I will be uh, toting around that court of moonshine I threatened you all with before we came on the air. Oh, God. All right. That sounds like, a, that sounds like a, a challenge. <laughs> all right. Ground control, take it away.